Good afternoon, everyone. What a stunning, uh, shocking in many ways presentation that gives us a lot to uh, study and think about in this, in this excellent conversation we're about to have. And I'm really pleased to be here to share it with you. My name is Laura Washington, and uh, I'm a big fan of all the sponsors uh, of this event today, this very worthy and very important event. But particularly, I have to give a shout out to the Woods Fund of Chicago, which I've been affiliated with for many years. And it's a very imp important, um, as Julia Stash uh, said earlier, for us to think about race. And I hope we're going to have some time to talk about that as part of this conversation. First, I'd like to uh, just briefly introduce uh, our very illustrious panel, who, who's a very learned and innovative group of people who really on the ground looking at these issues every day. And then we're going to get into some conversation, get some response from them to Mr. Travis's presentation and see really where we go from here because we've got a lot, obviously we have a lot of work to do. And getting again at that question that he raised, what are the implications of what we've heard today? Uh, I'm going to start on my immediate left with John Chisholm, who, is the, who has served as district attorney for Milwaukee County since 2007. He was recently featured in the New Yorker magazine for his efforts to reduce over-incarceration and its disproportionate impact on community of color. John Chisholm, welcome. <clears throat> Next we have Mark Levin, who is a policy director of Right on Crime in Austin, Texas. He's also the director of the Center for Effective Justice at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Welcome, Mark Levin. And, who's, and someone who's on the ground doing a lot of very important work right here in Chicago is Miriam Kaba, who's founder and director of Project NIA, which is an advocacy organizing popular education research and capacity building center that focuses on ending youth incarceration. <laughs> Got a fan club out there, huh? <laughs> I want to kick it off by um, sort of reminding um, us of what Julia said earlier, that we really want to have a, a conversation here today, and, some, and a conversation that's very authentic, with the words she's used, authentic, and maybe uncomfortable, because this subject has been uncomfortable for a lot of people for a very long time, and maybe that's one reason why we're where we are today. And I'd just like to open it up, Mary, with you by asking you to respond to what you've heard so far, specifically, can you, can you identify one important takeaway um, from Professor Travis's uh, presentation report? And, and is there an on-the-ground experience or opportunity that you've, uh, you are familiar with that would help address some of the issues that were raised in this report? Sure. Um, so I want to thank uh, the MacArthur Foundation and all of the partners for inviting me to join into this conversation. Um, I'm sitting on the left. And that means a lot of things <laughs> for people who know me. Um, and I, you know, I guess the takeaway for me is that um, a lot of the things that have been mentioned are things that people who are in this work know and understand to be true, right? Intuitively, we know that we're in a situation where there are way too many people locked up behind bars. We know that it costs a hell of a lot of money for us to keep people locked up behind bars. We really do know who is already behind bars. You just need to go into the various communities or look into your own circle if you are in certain particular places. I think we have all the information that we need. The challenge has been to try to take that information and to transform the policy decisions that have been made over a long period of time to get us to this particular point. Um, one point that was made by Professor Travis is that, you know, we are in a position where there are actually human beings locked up behind bars. It's not just about statistics. It's people and their lives and their communities that are being negatively impacted by this kind of policy decision making that's happening. I would only add that we cannot have a conversation about this issue without very specifically calling out the racialized and gendered nature of the approach and the interventions that have occurred. It isn't really by accident that we have so many black people locked up behind bars. 
You only have to look post-emancipation to look at how quickly black people supplanted white people behind bars. Um, and so we've always had a hyper-incarceration of black people, if not a mass incarceration of, white, of black people. If we can't address the racial issues and the racist policies that lead and funnel people through the system, then we're not going to actually get at the root of the problem. We're just going to find ourselves doing the same things over and over again. Um, and I think that's a problem. Here in Illinois, we can point to some successes that we've already had, right? We know, for example, that over the past 15 years, we've dramatically decreased the number of young people who are locked up in our juvenile prisons, for example, over 50%. And that was done by a whole different series of things, including a program here in Illinois called Redeploy Illinois, which came into being in 2004, which has been basically financially incentivizing structures and community groups and um, specifically, you know, kind of the government, state, Cook County uh, agencies to stop sending kids to prison, period. Stop sending them to prison. Find something else for them. I want to point out that for years and years and years, every possible research study suggested that prison sucks for children, right? <laughs> Right? Yeah, you can go, I don't think, you can, you can look every possible study that's ever been invented around incarceration and children says it's bad. We still have too many children behind bars. So how do we account for that? It's that we in this country have a punishment imperative that's a deeply part of the culture of the country. And since basically blackness is synonymous with criminality, it's going to be very hard to be able to end punishment mentalities and imperatives within this system. Because as soon as people, we know this from studies too, understand that a particular intervention is going to benefit black people, mm -hmm. then they're against it. So this is a problem for us. Right. You so know? you redeploy Illinois as an ex excellent example. And it's, it's no accident that maybe that's been more effective because yeah. We're dealing with young people. That's right. So how do we get? How do we have that conversation? How do we broaden that conversation to all adult. people? Well, Not, we, young people aren't the only human beings being yeah. locked up. It's, it's been pointed out. Well, we have adult redeploy, mm -hmm. and that's happening right now. And we can expand that and fund that more. Is there a political right? will to do that right now? I know? mean. That's a question for our elected officials, but also a question for the community as to what we're going to push for, as to what we want to have happen as to what we're comfortable you know, accepting within our particular state. And I think it's the jury's out for me as to whether or not people really want to decarcerate mm. significantly. Mm -hmm. I'm unclear that we have the full public will to do that because constantly people are being fed fear. We're in a current moment where like, you know, summer's around the corner is here. And so all the, quote, shootings that are occurring, and then the first thing people want to do is add new mandatory minimum sentences, new punishment, things you've done over and over again and failed at, but people are comfortable with accepting that. So I think we have to challenge ourselves and look into the mirror as people who live in this state to ask ourselves what we actually want, who we feel we need to be safe from, and to challenge ourselves to push our elected officials by rewarding them when they're not, quote unquote, saying that they're tough on crime. And maybe, as Professor Travis indicated, we need to have a, a different kind of conversation around values and yeah. who we value and who That's we don't. Right. That's right. Mark Levin, what's your takeaway? And, and if you want to respond to anything she said as well. Well, I mean, certainly uh, what we've seen since 2005, that's when I started working on criminal justice issues at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And then we launched Right on Crime in 2010 uh, to kind of take the effort national. And I would say there is a growing momentum uh, on all sides of the ideological spectrum in this country to do something serious about these problems, both at the state and the federal level. So uh, we've seen our own state, Texas, have a double digit percentage decline in both its incarceration rate and crime rate. And by the way, what's really interesting, over the last several years, the states that have reduced their incarceration rate have had crime go down more than those states that haven't. It. Crimes continue to go down 20 years in a row across the country. Um, but you also look at a state like Georgia, where they've reduced black incarceration by 20 percent, have passed major reforms in three consecutive sessions. Ohio, South Carolina, South Dakota. So there's all these states that have enacted pretty major reform packages, many of them including drug sensing reform, for example which is something Illinois certainly needs to do. Um, so most people know California. Uh, voters put uh, forward and passed as a ballot measure Proposition 47 that uh, reduced uh, possession of the smallest amounts of drugs from a felony to a misdemeanor. It also took uh, 
petty theft, certain low-level theft down to a uh, misdemeanor. Um, and, um, but what many people don't know is Utah just this year through their legislature, they don't have an ballot initiative, but they also reduced uh, drug possession, uh, the smaller amounts, to a misdemeanor from a felony. And that's huge, because you have people being able to go on for the rest of their life without the scarlet letter of a felony. And frankly, I'll tell you, in Texas, we passed a bill this session so people can get non-disclosure of a conviction, have it sealed if it's a misdemeanor. So that would be the second step to that, so you don't even have, at least after a few years of being on the straight and narrow, you don't even have uh, something on your record at all, even as a misdemeanor. Um, so uh, that's just one example to where the public is becoming more receptive and policymakers to approaches that are less punitive. From our standpoint, uh, I think we can ask the question, do you want to get even or do you want to get results? Because this addiction to punishment that you referred to, it too often actually makes that person more likely to recidivate rather than less likely because we cut them off from uh, job opportunities, from housing. Uh, here in Illinois, you can't get an occupational license to be a barber if you have a felony. Um, so uh, literally, I think we're making ourselves less safe and we're also doing damage to uh, a view of human dignity. And you know, a lot of people say, as do those of us on the right just want to save money? No, we also want to keep families together. We want people to be able to find redemption and uh, find fulfillment in the American dream. And it's, uh, you can't do that in prison and it's very hard to do that if you have the scarlet letter of a criminal record. In your work, uh, how power, what, what's the most powerful argument? Is it, is it the values discussion? Is it the cost discussion? Is it you know, other consequences? What, what, what do you think best makes the case? I know every place is different, but in well, your experience. Yeah, and so people always ask, well, what are we going to do if the state gets tons of money again if people are just doing this to save money? And I think there's $11 billion pension shortfall here, so I'm not sure that's a big uh, <laughs> thing. I wish we were rolling in money. But, yeah. you know, uh, I think at the end of the day, it is um, kind of... Uh, uh, can we get more public safety for, for less money? But more than that, can we do something that, that is more humane where people can, we're going to be able to support their families and be productive contributors to our society? I think, you know, when you see, uh, we, we have to realize everyone, who, almost everyone, it's 98% who goes to prison is going to come back and live next to you or me. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, it's crazy that we go one day, like we have a problem in Illinois here of max outs, where we're discharging people from prison without any supervision, uh, any reentry assistance. In Texas, we're releasing 1,000 people from solid, directly from solitary confinement, and yet we know huge violent recidivism from that. Um, so we're doing policies, and I was just over on a trip to Germany with Jeremy and John to look at the prisons there. They have probation officers come in a few months before the inmates release to start working with them to line up a job, line up a place to live. Um, so so it's a totally different mindset once you take the standpoint of we want to look forward rather than backwards about the crime that's already committed. We want to look forward is how do we uh, make this person a better citizen. Right. John. So what's remarkable about the, about the report from my perspective is everybody in this room has read uh, research papers, they've, uh, they've seen compelling rational arguments made, um, but this particular report is so deeply infused with values, that's what it comes down to. It's a challenge to the values of the criminal justice system. And as a representative of uh, one of the four major components of that system, you know, obviously you have the police, you have the, uh, the litigators, I guess I would call them, prosecutors, defense, defense bar, uh, you've got the courts and you've got the correction system. Um, each one of those systems is a values-based system. People get into public service um, in, with, with the predicate that they're gonna make their communities better by doing that kind of public service. I think that's the, the good faith presumption we should have with everybody. And what's so compelling about this report is it's kind of calling you back to your better nature. It's, it's showing you uh, in rational terms of what we've been doing with our criminal justice system, and it's challenging us to do better. So certainly from the, the prosecution's experience, um, there, there is, you know, let me, let me put one major caveat out there, and that is uh, that there is no one prosecution system in the United States. That's one thing that, that stood out clearly in our trip to Germany, a federal system, a unified system. Um, you have, you know, what, 3,200 separate criminal justice systems uh, in the United States. Uh, most of them are um, operated on uh, an elective uh, representative basis, so you have elected DAs, elected judges. And uh, so clearly we are, are more, um, you could say, susceptible or, or certainly 
um, more influenced by um, the, the public's perception of uh, crime, uh, pure and simple. And one of the challenges, therefore, is to examine ourselves. In the conversation we had before getting on stage, um, it was pointed out that the, uh, of those four, four decision points in the system, prosecutors are probably the least transparent and, and uh, the least examined of all the systems. And I would agree with that. I, I would agree with that completely. Um, I don't think that's done by design, um, but um, clearly one of, the, one of the challenges that I decided to take up when, when I was running for office in 2006 is just to address this issue head on. Um, we'd had a number of events in Milwaukee, um, just so you know, it may not be a, a, a surprise to anybody, but um, you had reports coming out showing that Wisconsin had um, the highest disparity rate uh, in the country uh, for African Americans in, in prison. Um, there were some significant tensions uh, in the city of Milwaukee based on um, police community relations, things that had occurred at the time that I was running. And so one of my, one of my decisions was simply, look, um, let's have somebody from outside, of not just my office, but outside the state, I worked with the Vera Institute at the time, have them come on in and take a look and, and examine what we do and determine whether or not what we do uh, is, uh, and I would argue immediately, unintentionally, um, causing this disparity? Is it contributing, contributing to it in any way? That's the first thing I think you can, you can take both from this report. It's, it's again, um, you know, you have to use both your head and your heart. If, if, you're, if you're committed to, uh, to justice, as every prosecutor in the country ought to be, um, you're, you're there to do the right thing. And so you have to take the, the information that's given you, and then you have to put it into practice in some meaningful way um, so that, that you can actually measure and, and try to get these results. That's not easy. That's, that's not, that is not in the, um, the structure of most DA's offices, to be, to, to be frank. When Vera came into my office, for example, we didn't have a case management system. It didn't exist. We, we operated the same way, you know, you would have recognized it if we were prosecuting cases in the 1950s. So that's changed. We actually have the ability to measure what we're doing. Now you have to have the will to open yourself up. But, but there's a challenge. Let's, let's be real about that. And that is um, that when you open yourself up, um, you, you, you make yourself politically vulnerable. And that's just the reality. So you're going to have to... When you say you, to you're, ta you're talking about the prosecutors. Prosecutors, sure. judges, mm -hmm. um, right. in, any, anybody in elected office, uh, when you open yourself up... Um, you might lose your job. You might lose your job. That's right. And, and that's, that's, a, a tough, uh, that's a tough argument to face up to for, you know... Well, for, again... Especially, it's like I said, some of these, many of these people want to do the right thing. They're, they got into it for the right reason. They want to be there to help the community. If they don't have their jobs, that's, that, that's then they exactly can't do it. Right. They're, they're like everybody else. They've got families. They're, they're trying to support... Uh, they're, they live in their communities, they're committed to their communities, um, but that's the challenge, is to have a broader discussion here. And, and so, um, and it, it takes many different forms. Uh, you know, it, just the way we talk about things sometimes. We recently worked with the uh, National Institute of Justice doing uh, what we call Sentinel, Sentinel Events Review, which was basically the premise that um, we run in perfect systems, and so why not, why not just acknowledge that and when something bad happens, Open yourself up to have an honest discussion. The airline industry does it. Uh, the, the medical profession does it. Other professions open themselves up to, mm -hmm. to examine why they got a bad outcome. Why can't we do it here? How do you do that? Well, one of the things you have to do is you have to develop a trusting relationship in an adversarial system. So, so public defenders and prosecutors, mm -hmm. right? You know, it, it, public defenders and prosecutors, as, as a rule, um, don't trust each other. And, and I've, been, I've been blessed, I've been fortunate. I've got, I've got a, a, a very uh, um, you know, uh, forward-thinking uh, head of the public defender's office who, who is absolutely committed to the, the vigorous representation of his clients, but he recognizes that you know, maybe if we, if we work closer as a system um, and actually examined what we did and saw the negative consequences of system involvement, we could minimize those through, through different processes that we engage in, and in doing so, address that critical issue, which is, which is fundamental and is, is front and center in the nation right now, and that is that, that the people that oftentimes need us, uh, need our services the most, trust us the least. 
and, 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 and it goes directly to the issue uh, of uh, racism and, right. and uh, the histor historical experience of people that encounter the system. So does that, does that present an opportunity? I mean, uh, you, you said there was, there's tensions in Milwaukee. There's tensions all over the country now around race for a number of reasons, not just over the issue of incarceration. Does that present, are we at a special fertile moment in history that opens up opportunities, Miriam? Yes, I think we can be. I do. Mm -hmm. I think we can be. Um, I think the Black Lives Matter, young people on the streets every single day uh, saying Black Lives Matter is helpful to forcing people to actually use the word black mm -hmm. rather than disproportionate minority contact of certain, you know what I mean? Like, right. it, that helps. Name you know, it for when, what you, it is. when people say black, it's like black doesn't make, saying black doesn't make you a racist, by the way, which I think a lot of people, or saying white doesn't make you a racist, because apparently that's also a problem these days. So, you know, we're in a position now, I think, where people, the environment is gonna push the conversation, whether we want it or not. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, uh, where are we gonna stand in relation to that conversation that's happening? The young people that I work with on a regular basis are critically aware of themselves, mostly as black young people in this country right now, um, as being people who are targets of the system. Mm -hmm mostly targets of the system. And I think unless we can actually do some work around changing not just the perception but the reality of that, then we're gonna have a whole bunch of people who are going to not trust the system. And I'm not, I mean, I think it's rational to not trust the system, personally. I do, mm -hmm. I think it's rational. And I agree 100% um, with uh, you know, Mr. Chisholm about the fact that there are good people in the system trying to do the best they can we have to get away, though, of looking at individuals only as, like, it's the systemic problems make it so that those good people get overwhelmed by the system. Well, the, what about that? Because the system, I mean, that is part of, I think, of the, the, the big obstacle. Yeah. The system does seem overwhelming. Right. It seems, you know, you heard the numbers from Professor Travis. It just seems so huge, and, and it seems po impossible to really overcome. How do you, how do you address that, 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 that issue? So here's one way that I think that we can address it as communities, and, and that comes from the experience that, that you uh, have deeply infused in you as a prosecutor. So part of our mission is to, is to uh, represent victims, to be a voice for, for victims in the case. But anybody that's been in the system for any period of time quickly realizes the distinction between a victim and offender is oftentimes um, almost, almost you know, indistinguishable. You just really, um, they, they oftentimes come from the same challenge environment and have been exposed oftentimes um, to really awful, awful um, things, you know, traumatic experiences that, uh, that lead to bad choices, um, but not necessarily irrational choices. They're choices that are, are constrained. So one of the discussions that we, we can have as a community is, is stop, stop creating these, these just clear, bright lines between victim and offender, and once you say offender, the, the, the only response has to be a punitive response. And, and well, even the, the, the language, even the, you even, use that word, it, it's a turnoff. Th th that's exactly right, and, and so um, that's one place that you can start. So, and, and again, one, one of the opportunities that we have as communities right now is to actually, is to actually look closely at the populations that intersect with our system and, and do it on a system-wide basis. You're often going to find that, that the individuals that are uh, getting the, the worst outcomes in your, in your health system, the, the worst outcomes in your public education system, uh, they're quickly intersecting with, with the criminal justice system, and they're receiving the least amount of resources from a community development, community revitalization uh, standpoint. So, so as a consequence, you put all those things together, and you can, you can track it. It's, it's absolutely predictable. Uh, when, when a young person comes into the system, either as a child in need of protective services or, or uh, is failing in the school system before third grade, um, this is predictable where they're going to end up eventually. And, and that's where, as a community, we have to get around the notion again. And, it's, and, and uh, one of the ways you address it is, is through what MacArthur is trying to get at, because the first contact is often going to be in the jail or in the juvenile justice side of things. And if you, if you take a different approach, which simply says, I'm not going to measure my success by how many prosecutions I have, mm -hmm. how many convictions I get. I'm going to measure success by, are we stabilizing families? Are we stabilizing neighborhoods? Are, are we reducing, reducing the, the harmful impact of crime for both victims, offenders, and our community? I think that's where the discussion has to go. 
Mark, you were nodding your head, did you? Oh yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. It's certainly one of the things we've supported very much is restorative justice, including things like victim offender mediation, uh, which is focused largely on property offenses. Uh, one of the things we know is if someone goes, uh, someone sends to incarceration, they almost never uh, pay restitution because they're not able to. They lose their job and so forth. Um, so many times, victims, if you look at surveys of victims, they actually prefer a restorative justice approach, and they ought to have that option. Um, you know, I think to address some of the issues you brought up, um, one of the issues in the criminal justice system is there's so much discretion at so many levels. And uh, one of the examples is uh, parole revocations. In Illinois, there's around 10,000 parole revocations a year, and many of those are for technical violations, missing appointments and uh, testing positive for marijuana, for example. Um, and so you could start to set some bright line rules about you know what, uh, what's, what type of conduct has to occur before somebody is sent back to prison for a long period, knowing that you can do things like the Hawaii Hope Court, where someone may go to jail for a week Weekend to send a message that they need to comply with their probation or parole, but they still keep their job. Um, and so those uh, areas where there's all this discretion over these technical violations, for example, that can lead to large disparities depending on who the probation or parole officer is, where they are in the state, a whole host of other issues, you know, obviously including race may be one of them. Um, you know, the other thing about doing things like lowering uh, low-level drug possession to a misdemeanor, or adjusting the property offense thresholds, which is something we did in Texas this year. We raised it from 500 to 750 before it's a felony. Here in Illinois, if you steal more than $300 from a store, it's a felony, and it's different. It's 500 if you steal from someone else, uh, which doesn't make any sense, but uh, <laughs> these things don't keep up with inflation. Uh, these things were passed decades ago, and uh, uh, so if you simply adjust these things for inflation, um, then uh, certainly uh, that is one of those bright line things where you don't have discretion and you'll have more people punished as misdemeanors rather than felons. Um, so uh, I think it's a host of different solutions. Um, one of the things that uh, we've seen as, uh, in Illinois there's been a 330% increase in incarceration over the last couple decades, and like a lot of states, that tends to mean so much of the resources go into the prisons that there's less left for the alternatives. Um, whether that's problem solving courts, treatment, and so forth. And so the, the redeploy thing has been very good in, in, in uh, reversing that to some extent, and certainly expanding adult redeploy to all counties here, I think, would be very helpful. So, um, I, you know, I think it's a range of, of things that need to be done. Can I also say, I think that we already know what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that the report that, uh, you know, Professor Chavez points to all these things. We know that after 50 years old, you're less likely to actually commit any more crimes, release the elderly prisoners. Just do it. Like, I don't know what else we need to do. Just release people, you know? Why, what are we trying to do here? First of all, I'm sorry, but like giving people 100 and 200 and 300 years uh, sentences, you know, past their lifetime in prison, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. 10 years is terrible to spend in prison. So is 20, so is 30, so stop giving people long-term prison sentences. This is ridiculous, we can change that pretty easily. Abolish bail. We're gonna get a lot of decarceration from that, right? right. At the front end of the situation. I mean, there are so many ways that we could be doing things that are really tiny, small reforms that if we wanted to change mm -hmm. the system, we could do it very, very quickly. And, Which is what I think is a problem. And, unless and, we do and, that. and a great point. And I'd, I'd like to hear some more about the how. We know what we want to do. We know it has to be done. There are some folks in this room, maybe not in this room, but certainly outside this room, who aren't convinced that it's worth doing. So how do we get? How do we convince the maybe people of goodwill who aren't there yet? And how do we get them on the team? And then how do we get it done? And so and I was just going to briefly comment. It, it's extraordinarily hard to to message this to the community when the community is suffering through periods of, of um, really just unacceptable violence, mm -hmm. right? It's just, and that has to be said. And there's no, there's again no magic bullet here, but I can tell you this, and that is that we've had 75 homicides in the city of Milwaukee uh, this year. You know, over 85% over of them are, are uh, young black men who, who are, shooting each other and and so this is and, and the way that's messaged i can just tell you because i was listening to the right wing radio station on the way up here saying that it's because of chisholm's experiment um that, that, that good for you congratulations yeah. <laughs> you know that, that, that we're having these high rates of violence it, it's it's absurd but that's the message that you have to confront and, mm -hmm. and it's a real issue it's it's a real so we have this obligation to address issues like that we have to try to change these conditions 
that, that uh, result in these outrageous levels uh, in, um, among a very small population that drive the policy. I'm just telling you right now, that drives right. the policy. You, 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 you know, why 100 years? Because you're trying to say that, well, look, if we're going to give a guy 10 years for an ounce of cocaine, uh, we've got to give him mm -hmm. you know, uh, 30 years for, for shooting somebody, and we've got to give him 100 years for, for killing somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll make it perfectly clear, you know, what, what I'm directing these efforts at is the 80%, the 90% of the population we encounter on a regular basis. Uh, look, the system is designed and, and appropriate for people that shoot other people, people that sexually assault other people, and people that rob other people by force, things like that. Look, th those are individuals that, that should be removed from the community for a period of time. We can argue about what that appropriate period of time is, um, but what we're really saying is that that, that, that fear in the community has driven all the other uh, sentences and recommendations that, that are going right along with it with a very harmful effect. Even though well, many of the people that are making those decisions don't live in those communities. That's right. They, they don't have any, I mean, they have no reason to fear, that, uh, you know, because right. they don't have to deal with it every day. And isn't that part of the problem? Sure. And, it, and it's compounded by what we talked about earlier. And that's, that's a, a population that's been over-criminalized and is not no longer able to participate in the democratic process, right? So, so the decisions are often be, being made in state houses that are com comprised of people that fear, fear uh, the, the, the inner cities of, of, their, of their states. Well, and I, I'm glad you mentioned aggravated robbery, but it's interesting, in Illinois, the penalty for selling one gram of drugs is the same as aggravated robbery, so you can see how our sentencing laws are disproportionate. But, um, you know, I think it brings to mind when you talk about uh, these uh, neighborhoods where there are high concentrations of violent crime that we need to do something about the exposure to violence of, uh, that children have in these communities, and the public schools are the place where you could start uh, working on that because they come in contact with these children and doing some curricula that have been proven to help address that trauma. Um, but that's a long-term strategy, obviously, but I think prevention ought to be part of the discussion as well. Um, but I think, let me answer your question about trying to uh, do this politically, and that is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the public opinion polls are, are really pretty strong, actually, uh, in terms of 70 or 80 percent of the public uh, on all sides of the spectrum agreeing with things like drug sensing reform. We've done a poll or two ourselves. Um, and, uh, but by the same token, you certainly uh, can see certain elected officials worried about how something could be mischaracterized in a 30-second ad uh, or whatnot. So one of the things we do is we have a statement of principles that's been signed by people like Newt Gingrich and Grover Norquist and Ed Neese, the former Attorney General under President Reagan, Bill Bennett, the former drug czar. Nobody can say any of these people are soft on crime. So we do um, uh, do things like op-eds and uh, testifying before legislative bodies and so forth. But just to make sure that the public realizes that, um, that these things are not soft on crime, uh, they're actually holding people accountable. Um, we, we have a big problem in Texas where actually people are choosing to go to state jail for six months instead of probation. It's a, here in Illinois, you know, it's a seven, 6,000 people are going for an average of seven months for these lowest level felonies. And it's, it's, it's really destructive because uh, the one thing prisons do do is obviously the time that someone's in prison, they're not uh, committing a crime in society. But the negative consequences of those short-term incarceration in terms of job loss, loss uh, of connections to family and community, those are far greater. Uh, and again, for these people going for six or seven months, it's nonviolent, a lot of drug possession, things that we're really not trying to incapacitate for anyway. So it goes back to what John said about let's focus uh, prison on the very small number of people who actually need to be there. Um, I think the public is uh, ready for that type of approach, um, but undoubtedly um, it's important to have a lot of voices um, standing behind those courageous uh, elected officials. But I can tell you nobody's lost an election in Texas or any other state in the last few years on this that I'm aware of. In fact, we saw uh, Nathan Deal, the governor of Georgia, John Kasich, the governor of Ohio, campaigning on these, uh, on the reforms and reducing incarceration. Miriam, you talked before about needing to get the community more involved. Is it, I mean, and, and I heard you saying the community that's most affected, the folks that live in the hood. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are some, what, what's missing there? What are the strategies and what help do those communities need to to, to, to make that happen, because yeah. obviously those people have elected officials that are supposed to be responding to them as well. 
Well, I mean, I think that, we, you know, we can be clear. I think today, just in the DNA info, I read a, a piece about mothers in Inglewood who are in the streets right now after shootings, um, saying there will be no other shootings, you know, coming out of their houses and being in the community and holding those young people together, right, and doing it without funding, without any, vis you know, visibility, whatever, and that's happening over and over again. The issue, though, is the years and years and years of depleting these communities divesting from these communities, taking human potential from those communities, have left many of these communities completely devastated. There are no jobs for people. There are barely grocery stores. There are, there are some structural things that are going to have to shift and change if we're going to talk about really kind of bringing some community stuff into being. So I think that's number one. But number two, I'll also say that I'm, I'm very hopeful about the community level potential of what we are doing in places like, you know, Vera put out, they have a, a project called Common Justice where they're doing restorative justice with violent offenders. Right? In communities in Brooklyn and in the Bronx and in other places where people are holding on to those people and realizing that prison actually makes you worse. That there is, you know, that the community understands that. They know when people come back, they're not better than when they left. In fact, that they're, you know, having to do more to keep those people on the, on the straight and narrow and they don't have the resources for it. So I think that if we seed and, and support more community-based alternatives really do that with real resources, with real time, with real investment in the way that we love to invest in the prison and the way that we love to give more money to cops every single day. Everything is a cop-related effort. No, it isn't going, that is not gonna work, I'm sorry. We have seen that over and over and over again. More money to the police. Now we're gonna give them money for Bonnie cameras. Now we're gonna get, but we cannot find money for mental health services. We've got six community clinics closed. What is that? You know, we're going to decarcerate people from the Cook County Jail to send them to what community-based mental health clinic? The six that were closed, plus C4 on the edge of closing, one of the biggest places we refer young people to. Where's the money for them to stay alive so that we don't have to spend $212,000 to send somebody to Cook County Jail for a year? Right, well, that's right? A, the, part of the argument is the numbers. The numbers have not been, you know, laid we out there in, in a way, right. We need, we, the money does not need to keep going to failing systems. Right. The money needs to be put into the actual communities that are already divested from. Nobody wants to do that though. That's not popular. And every time we try to have this conversation where we say that, people say, yeah, 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 but what about this? And my thing is, no, not yeah, 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 what about this? Give money there and then let's see how things shift and change. Right. Let's see how things shift and change. No more money to the prison. No. Yeah. $80, $80 billion is enough. $220 billion if you include the courts and the police that we spend as a country every single year is enough. I know I have friends in the audience. I'm seeing hands. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at her from the side, you know, because I know people who are in the system who need money for stuff in the system. Right. I get it. And I, you know, John brought up, brought up a really excellent point. It was, it, it is John. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> John brought up a really excellent point about the DAs being underfunded. All true. But the community is severely underfunded. Right, true, right. And until we fix that, we're going to keep sending people into a system that is failing those people and our community. That's so. True. I feel, I feel I have to keep repeating that at no. every place that I'm at until somebody listens and actually starts People to are divert listening. the image. Well, yeah. And this is being yeah. live streamed. And, all right, we and need I, to do that. All right. no, and, so, <laughs> and I think it, it's just an excellent point. And, and again, as a system actor, um, my, my response would be that we also have to change the way we, we view our roles and, and our responsibilities. One way you can do it as a prosecutor is, is again, foundational to my office uh, is my community prosecution unit, and, and that means that they are always located in the areas where they are needed most, and their, their primary responsibility isn't to, isn't to find more people to put in jail and prison, it's to help solve problems. So they always have to be linked with a community-based organization, dedicated police officers that do community policing, uh, people from the Department of Corrections for re-entry work, working with the Public Health Department, working with the Department the Department of Neighborhood Services has reorganized how they do, you know, they structure their thing to actually work directly with communities so that they can, again, help solve their own problems. Exactly what Miriam says is exactly right. It's been proven by, by 
Eric Cadora's work and others, is that after a period of time, you destabilize these communities and, and you leave them undefended. And as a consequence, they rely on police services. And we have set up this sort of industrial system since the 1970s of, of how we deal with crime problems. And we measure our success by how many people we arrest, how many people we prosecute, how many people we put in prison. We have to break that cycle and say, and, and even change our roles. Yes, I still need, I need experienced people that, that, that can take a very dangerous offender and constitutionally, legally, appropriately um, um, prosecute those, those individuals. There's all sorts of, of appellate accountability for that. But I also need people that are problem solvers and that are willing to live and work in their community, develop relationships so that the, the, the greatest success, look, the, the bottom line is, is you know, as I mentioned earlier, it just takes one bad incident and all of the hard work we do goes out the window. There are a lot of people that don't trust uh, our system and don't trust me to, based on, for example, uh, uh, not charging a police officer for, for uh, a police related shooting. Oh, that, all of that hard work. That's a big work, deal here in Chicago. Yeah, right all that hard work can go down, down sure. the tubes on, on one case. But if you've developed a, a relationship where people in the community say, uh, my community prosecutor says, my prosecutor, that's, 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 a, that's transformational. They don't say your prosecutor, Chisholm. They say, my prosecutor. Right. That's how we have to, to change the, the relationship with the community. All right. Well, uh, we, we have to, this has been an incredibly important and rich conversation. We have to wrap it up. But I want to end it by asking each one of you, I'll start with you, Mark, too. What, is your, what are your marching orders? You have the governor's representative here. We're going to be hearing from him shortly. What, would you be, what are your marching orders to the governor and to our legislature and other political actors in particular uh, for next steps and, and, and what they can do tomorrow, next week, next year on this issue? Well, in fact, and we're going to be releasing a paper with our counterpart, the Illinois Policy Institute, in the coming days, which is going to set forth much of this. The John Howard Society has published some great uh, papers. Um, so there's, uh, and we've heard a lot of good solutions today, and there's certainly examples from other states uh, that can be followed. Um, so uh, I would certainly say be courageous, and certainly uh, to reiterate what the last two said, um, we know that uh, doing this correctly means that you've got to have viable alternatives to incarceration. And so you do have to fund those things. Um, and it can be done certainly from the savings, uh, and because of course uh, locking people up is the most expensive approach. Um, but you know, you talked about mental health, a few of the examples, uh, obviously things like mental health courts, 24-hour crisis centers, a place people can bring, uh, police can bring someone other than the jail. Um, even a program where uh, people that have gone to jail dozens of times for minor uh, things like trespass who have a mental health issue, uh, someone comes, checks on them uh, a few times a week, make sure they're taking their medication. Those do amazing uh, job of, of keeping those folks out of jail. So um, it's basically creating a full spectrum. We started out, I think, in a lot of jurisdictions across the country with simple basic probation, which often is unfortunately just a file in a drawer, mm -hmm. and then incarceration on the other hand. And we've been filling in that spectrum with things like whether it's drug courts or referrals to treatment, restorative justice, victim offender mediation, a whole host of different uh, approaches. Um, and so um, I think Illinois is in a great position to uh, make some uh, really uh, significant reforms. And in doing so, Illinois, uh, which has already done some things like redeploy, uh, would join a whole range of states. And frankly, we're now seeing at the federal level some very significant legislation that we're involved with uh, that could move forward in Congress. Right. So uh, I would be bold. <laughs> be bold. Miriam. Yeah. Um, I have so many things. I'd say end prison, but I'm not going to tell the governor to do that. Um, I, think, I think leave no one behind. I think I'm really worried about these, the non, 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 you know, the non-violent offender who did non, but you know, like, we're going to have to deal with violent offenses. We just do. Mm -hmm. um, and not all violent offenses are equal. Somebody defending themselves from an abuser who's in a violent, you know, like there's just, we have to deal with violent offenses. It, because even if we let everybody, every single person out of the system currently that is there for drug use, we're still at like 1.7 million people behind bars. Mm -hmm. So that's the reality of the situation. It's, you know, we can talk about the end of the drug war, that's important. Um, the last thing I will say is I think we have to end cash bail. I do, I do, I want the governor to take that up. Mm -hmm. I want somebody to actually, focus on that. That will be a huge decarceration. Uh, you know, if we can do that, we're going to see some real results quickly. Um, and we're going to stop with having poor people locked up because they're poor. I think that's really, really important. And I do. I do. Um, 
And then just quickly, finally, I think that um, I don't want to hear any more conversations about over-incarceration that do not center race, gender, sexuality, class, all of the different ways that these issues actually manifest within the system. We, we can't talk about these issues from a raceless place. Right. We have to address that issue. We have to talk about black people. We do, yes. everybody, when you leave here. <laughs> well, everybody commit to that. Okay. Raise your hands, you will commit to doing this. We're talk about blackness, okay? Great. And the, con the confluence between that and criminality and breaking that open so that we can move forward and really see some real dramatic changes. So Absolutely. that's what I'd say. Thank you. John Chisholm, yeah. you get the final word. So I would never presume to tell the Illinois governor anything. <laughs> <laughs> Governors get a little nervous around me for some reason. And, uh, Just the, give him um, some prank. <laughs> <advice>. <laughs> the, uh, but what I would do is, what, what I can do is, is I can advocate to my fellow prosecutors, which, which is what I do. I, I, um, I have, um, for the last four or five years, chaired the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, which is, which is composed of mostly major city prosecutors, and we look towards best practices. And this is one, you know, this, this general discussion here is the discussion that we have. You saw recently that Cy Vance, for example, um, uh, undertook the, the study of uh, racial disparity in the New District Attorney New York uh, office as well, and um, and that was that that was based on the work that we'd started with Vera back in 2006. So um, so there's a narrative of progress out there, is what I, I would argue, is that I think uh, prosecutors across the country are increasingly understanding um, that that because they have so so much enormous discretionary authority. Um, and because they are so closely connected to the communities that they serve, um, that they have to be willing to open themselves up, uh, be more transparent, be more accountable, and be more open to figuring out what, what really makes a difference um, and actually reduces the number of victims that we have out there and um, in, in the same process reduce the number of people that, that we're putting in jails and prisons. Um, it just has to be done uh, for, for all the reasons that have been stated here. There's much work to be done, but much to be optimistic about. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and, and ideas and your work with us today. John Chisholm, Mark Levin, Miriam Kaba. Thank you. So I want to say that I am incredibly inspired by uh, the conversation that, took, uh, that just took place. It makes me want to say that the message from the conversation is we know what the problem is. Thank you, Jeremy. We actually know what to do, thanks to everybody that was here. And I think the message that is being echoed is, let's just do it. And the thing that gives us optimism is that we can see that there are people who are already taking the lead to do it. So that's my takeaway from the conversation, and I hope you share my sense of how valuable it is as it contributes to the national conversation.